Hello, I'm Kim Freeman, and welcome to St. David's Bible Study. Greetings to the roomies and the zoomies and the YouTubies. And if you're viewing this online for the first time, if you'll contact the church at parishadmin at stdavidchurch.org, we'll make sure you can get the free class study materials and journey with us. So let's open with prayer. Father, thank you for a day that gives us great guidelines about prayer, and so may it stir us to pray with persistence and complete trust in you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 18, and we are about to encounter quite a cast of characters today. We'll meet a persistent widow, an unjust judge, a proud Pharisee, a humble tax collector, protective disciples, trusting children, a conflicted rich ruler, disciples with selective hearing, and one very determined blind beggar. And there's a connection between last week's chapter, Luke 17, and the opening parable in today's lesson. Last time, remember, Jesus was talking to his disciples about the in-between time in the kingdom of God. The kingdom was both present now in his ministry and within them, and yet it was still to come in the future in its fullness. So, disciples must remain faithful as they lived in a sinful world and awaited the kingdom. And the problem of evil and suffering and the need for justice would afflict Jesus' followers as they would soon experience persecution. And as they wrestled with these hardships, they could trust that their Heavenly Father listened to their prayers for relief, and justice would come in God's perfect timing. So that's the reason Jesus told this parable to his disciples. In verse 1, it says he wanted to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Why? Because prayer with God is a necessary part of our faith walk. Our Father is a relational being who desires personal interaction with his children. And to always pray does not mean to mindlessly chant words over and over or to think long prayers must drone on and on. No, always praying means to make prayer as natural to us as breathing in and breathing out. We just do it. We carry on a continual conversation conversation with God through the day, pausing and resuming, pausing and resuming. We keep mentioning our requests before God, believing that God will answer. You see, if we don't pray, we lose heart and get discouraged. But when we pray, it keeps us from giving up. God expects us to keep on praying until the answer comes. And that's why the word persistence summarizes Jesus's first parable so well. It's about a desperate widow and a stubborn judge. And the parable uses a lesser to greater argument, the meaning if the lesser thing is true, then how much more the greater thing must be true. It contrasts the reluctant action of a judge, the lesser, with the loving action of God, the greater. So verse 2 says, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. So he was most likely a Gentile judge appointed by Rome, not a Jewish elder. And these judges were notoriously corrupt, fond of taking bribes. This man showed no deference toward anyone, divine or human. Verse 3, there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Without the aid of a husband or children to provide for her, she was vulnerable and helpless, and her only hope was legal protection. She had a legitimate grievance and was calling upon the judge to make a third party give her what she was entitled to. Her greatest personal asset was her persistence. Verse 4 says, for some time he refused. Now, we aren't told why. He could have been waiting for a bribe. As a judge, he should have been a champion for those who needed justice. But when this widow came for help, he ignored her. He turned a blind eye to justice. He would neither rule in her favor nor protect her from her opponent's attempt to defraud her. And now the surprise comes in verse four in the judge's interior monologue. The judge said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. 
He's grown tired of her. And even worse, she was hurting his reputation, embarrassing him with her persistence. He may have become the town laughing stock as people watched that widow show up every day, pounding on his door. Maybe she camped outside his doorstep and she was willing to drive him crazy until she got results. Well, finally, to get rid of this irritating woman, he would see that she got justice. Out of sheer exasperation, he would now become her advocate. In verse 6, Jesus said, listen to what the unjust judge says. It means reflect on the judge's reaction to these persistent requests of the woman, which represent the prayers of the saints. Now, Jesus was not comparing God to this contemptuous judge as though God would treat believers in this way. Instead, this parable showed that even if an evil man can be made to deal justly by a persistent woman, how much more would a righteous God who loves his people bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? That's 24-7 around the clock. God's people who persist in prayer can know that God will not keep putting them off. God is not indifferent or inattentive or deaf. He hears your prayers and acts on your behalf. So the point of the parable, persistence pays off. Unlike the widow who had to beg for justice, Jesus's followers are God's children who have his ear at all times. And unlike the widow who had no one to plead her case, Christians have an advocate in heaven. First John 2 1 says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So God hears and answers prayer, not because we harass him, but because he's just. And he may not answer as quickly as we'd like, but he is at work behind the scenes. Even if there is a delay in our prayers being answered, we should not give up praying. God's delays are not the delays of inactivity, but of preparation. In verse 8, Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So believers bear some responsibility during the Messiah's absence. Believers are to persevere in faith and pray and watch for his return. Well, in verse 9, Jesus told a second parable aimed at those in his audience who were falsely confident of their religious uh, righteousness and who looked down on everyone else. The first parable taught that persistence in prayer is important. The second parable teaches that attitude in prayer is also important. So two men went to the temple to pray, and these two men were as different as could be. The one was a respected, law-abiding religious leader, a Pharisee, and the other was a Jewish trader working for Rome, a despised tax collector. The fact that this hated tax collector had come to pray at the temple added interest to the story. The people would expect to see the Pharisee praying there, but maybe not the tax collector. The Pharisee is an example of the wrong way to approach God, while the tax collector is an example of the right way. So let's listen in on each man's prayers. In verse 11, the arrogance of the Pharisee was almost comical. And yet, Jesus' caricature of him was really pretty accurate. The Pharisee cleverly couched praise for himself in the form of thanks to God. This Pharisee's separatism and desire to remain clean before God had really hardened into a lifestyle of self-righteousness. He stood by himself and prayed, hoping to announce to all within earshot how good he was. He thanked God that he was not a sinner like everybody else. Now, while the Pharisee was probably not like everybody else in many ways, he erred in thinking that he was not a sinner. All people are sinners. This Pharisee compared himself favorably to the tax collector that he noticed praying across the way, telling God that he himself had never cheated or sinned or committed adultery like other men. And by the way, God, I fast twice a week, which is far more than the law requires, and I tithe my income, all proofs of my piety. While fasting had great spiritual value, the religious leaders had turned it into a way to gain public approval. So this Pharisee was confident of his righteousness. Meanwhile, he despised the tax collector, even though he too was in the temple praying to the same God. 
How sad that the Pharisee, as a religious leader, wasn't moved with compassion to behave like a spiritual shepherd and go minister to the humble tax collector who was seeking God. Instead, the Pharisee remained aloof under the delusion that he, not the tax collector, was more righteous, more acceptable before God. His estimation of his spirituality was greatly exaggerated. The Pharisee didn't ask God for mercy because he was too busy reeling off all the good things he had done. He was absorbed in his own virtue. His devout religion had spawned self-worship. He had not prayed in the correct attitude of humility before God. The Pharisee showed no sense of his own sinfulness before God. Had he recognized his own sin, he would have viewed himself and the tax collector as equals before God. Well, the Pharisee was giving himself a testimonial before God, and he really didn't go there to pray. He went to inform God how good he was, but God was not impressed. You know, prayer that recites our accomplishments is nothing more than pious conceit. When we pray, we ought to recite God's accomplishments instead for all the things God has done for us and for others. That kind of prayer directs praise to the right one. And the standard of comparison matters. When we compare our lives against the life of Jesus, all that is left to say is, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, in verse 13, in contrast, the tax collector stood some distance away, probably along the outer perimeter of the temple court, but within sight of the Pharisee. His standing apart conveyed his sense of unworthiness to approach God. His sense of sin was so great that he would not, as was customary, look toward heaven while he prayed. The act of beating one's breast was a sign of sorrow. The man openly acknowledged his guilt. He knew he had cheated people on their taxes. His conscience bothered him, and he so desperately wanted to get right with God. So his prayer was very simple. He offered God no list of virtues, no summary of his good deeds, no self-congratulation. He only pled for God's mercy to escape the judgment his sin deserved. Well, in verse 14, the parable ended with a dramatic reversal. Jesus said it was the honest, brokenhearted prayer which won acceptance before God. Jesus endorsed the tax collector's humility in contrast to the Pharisee's pride. The tax collector gave himself the one-word label that all people deserve to wear, sinner. Well, both men left the temple for home, but only one arrived justified before God. And that word justified means God's act of declaring people not guilty of sin. So only the tax tax collector recognized his sin. Therefore, he was the only one God justified. The self-righteous Pharisee admitted no sin. God did not justify him. He returned home no different than when he left. His prayer had not touched heaven. It was merely a self-congratulatory speech. So Jesus concluded with, everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So in prayer, a proper attitude is important. Next scene, verse 15, people were bringing their babies to be touched by Jesus, and this refers to the tradition of a rabbi placing his hand on the head of a person to pronounce a blessing. So I imagine quite a long line of people. The disciples apparently considered the arrival of these families as an intrusion on Jesus's time. The disciples weren't being cruel, probably just protective of Jesus. They viewed this interruption as a drain of Jesus' time and energy. And verse 15 says they rebuked the crowd. But what's so touching about this scene to me is that Jesus gladly made time for children. He was approachable. And then Jesus turned the rebuke back upon his disciples and said, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. In verse 16, Jesus took this opportunity to reveal to his audience, especially his disciples, that God's kingdom belongs to little children. Why? Why? 
Because children display humility, faith, dependence, and trust. They simply believe they'll be provided for. God wants us to show the same attitude of trust in him. Verse 17, to enter his kingdom, we need the attitude of a child, an open mind, obedience, humility, and trust in God. Next scene, my favorite one. In verse 18, a rich young ruler approached Jesus and asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Well, in verse 19, instead of answering the man's question, Jesus took issue with the way the man addressed him as good teacher. He said, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. Well, the man might have been using flattery, but Jesus forced the young man to reflect on his words and to distinguish whether the ruler truly believed Jesus was God or whether he was expressing a polite, respectful greeting. Because only God is truly good, the man had made an absolutely truthful statement about Jesus, but did the man realize it? So Jesus was testing him in essence, do you know who I am? And I picture Jesus looking at him very intently. So the man may or may not have caught the implication of Jesus's remark. But the man viewed eternal life as something that a person could earn through good deeds, and he wanted assurance that he had done everything necessary. In verse 20, Jesus rattled off five of the Ten Commandments. He quoted only those that are relating to human relationships, adultery, murder, stealing, lying, honoring parents. Jesus omitted God's tenth commandment about coveting, and he skipped over the first four commandments regarding our relationship with God himself. Well, in verse 21, to this, the young man responded, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Now here, don't you wish Luke had more details? We can't hear the man's tone of voice or watch his body language, so it's unclear whether the man was sincere in his answer or whether he said this in an arrogant fashion, feeling entitled that he deserved eternal life, or whether he appeared as blind to his shortcomings as the Pharisee in the previous parable because no one can perfectly keep God's laws. Or just maybe he acted a little disappointed that this good teacher, Jesus, wasn't able to offer something more. To be clear, though, Jesus didn't quote the law to him as a means of salvation, but held it up as a mirror to reveal the man's sins. Eternal life comes when one believes in Jesus. And that's why in verse 22, Jesus said, you still lack one thing. The other shoe is about to drop. Sell everything you have and give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. Ooh, Jesus has just touched the tender spot, the source of the man's security and identity. If he could not surrender his possessions, he would be violating the first commandment, which said, you shall have no other gods before me. You see, Jesus discerned that what the ruler lacked was undivided loyalty to God, for his wealth occupied the central place in his life. It was the obstacle keeping him from inheriting eternal life. Jesus asked him to give away his wealth, not because having it was bad, but because the man was more concerned with with his wealth than he was with following Jesus or obtaining eternal life. It was a test of the man's allegiance. Jesus has already taught that one cannot serve both God and money, so the test was designed to see which the man preferred. In verse 23, when he heard this, the ruler became very sad. This man had not expected such an answer from Jesus. He turned on his heel and departed with a heavy heart. And even though the ruler had the spiritual sensitivity to be saddened, he could not part with the trappings of his lifestyle. He just would not surrender his wealth and follow Jesus. Offered discipleship, the man chose to return to his possessions. So his reaction illustrated his priority. He wanted to stay rich. He didn't want to sell his things. Wealth was his true God. He's a picture of how close a person can come to salvation and yet turn away in unbelief, to be so close and yet so far. You know, in verse 24, we're told in Mark's gospel in chapter 10 that Jesus looked at him and loved him. 
As Jesus watched his departure, he made no attempt to call him back because the price of free will is that God cannot force the free to make the right decisions in life. Jesus commented sorrowfully to the crowd that it was hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of God because they were tempted to depend on their own resources rather than on God. With a deep sigh, Jesus spoke a proverb for what was impossible. And in this lament, Jesus was using hyperbole, exaggeration for effect. He said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Oh, this was contrary to conventional wisdom. The Jews believed wealth was a sign of God's blessing. So Jesus has just explained that riches can often prove to be a stumbling block. Rich people often don't feel a deep spiritual hunger to seek God. They don't perceive any needs in their lives. They're self-sufficient. But wealth can never give one eternal life. You know, both Jesus and the ruler were sad, and for the very same reason, both realized that the ruler's wealth had hindered him from entering the kingdom. Well, in verse 26, the listening Jews were astounded that Jesus said riches actually worked against people finding God. So they asked, well, who then can be saved? If rich people don't qualify for entry into the kingdom, what hope was there for others? So Jesus answered in verse 27, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Where salvation was impossible for humans to achieve, it's possible with God. Salvation is a gift of a gracious God who receives repentant sinners. Well, Peter's been thinking, and in verse 28, he's begun to wonder if the disciples had passed the sell everything test. Were their personal sacrifices enough? I mean, Peter had walked away from a prosperous fishing business, sacrificed his economic future, and even left his wife in the care of others so he could devote himself exclusively to following Jesus. Peter had done exactly what Jesus required of the rich young ruler, but he needed reassurance, and he blurted out, Lord, we have left all we had to follow you. Well, Jesus affirmed Peter. And said, anyone who had left home, wife, or brothers, or parents, or children for the sake of the kingdom would receive much more family in this life and eternal life in the age to come. So the church becomes a place where new brothers and sisters become a family of God. And thus the rewards of discipleship are both present and future. So theirs was a wise investment that would pay eternal dividends. In verse 31, Jesus took the 12 aside. They needed to know something very serious. They needed to know what would happen as he approached Jerusalem. You know, he had begun to tell them about this before, and he doesn't want them to think that these coming events were a terrible mistake. Jesus was determined to go to Jerusalem, not to take it by storm, but to fulfill everything that was written about the prophets, about the Son of Man. So Jesus told his disciples what three different groups of people would do, the Jews, the Gentiles, and his Father God. So first, in verse 32, he focused on what the Jews would do. Remember, he has already told them about his impending death. Back in chapter 9, verse 22, he said he'd be rejected by Israel's religious leaders. And in 944, he said he'd be betrayed. Now Jesus mentioned the foretelling of these events by the Jewish Old Testament prophets and that he would fulfill all their prophecies. Next, he added what the Gentiles would do. They would mock, insult, spit, flog, and kill him. You see, the Gentiles enter the story because while it's the Jewish leaders who reject Jesus, they had to submit to Rome's authority in cases of capital punishment. Only Pontius Pilate could call for a crucifixion. But I love in verse 33, because that's where Jesus mentioned what his father God would do. God would raise Jesus up on the third day. And here's an important thing to note. Jesus never foretold the cross without also foretelling the resurrection. That's so important because the resurrection was God's approval that Christ's death was sufficient. Jesus knew that shame lay before him, but he was equally certain that glory lay before him too. He knew what the malice of men would do, but he also knew what the power of God could do.
Well, bless their hearts in verse 34, the disciples did not understand. Its meaning was hidden from them, which either suggests that God prevented them from understanding until later, or the future that Jesus has just described differed so dramatically from their expectations that they chose to remain in denial. Maybe they still clung to the idea of a conquering king. The human mind has a way of listening only to what it wants to hear and of dismissing unpleasant truth. Well, in the last scene in verse 35, as Jesus approached Jerusalem, a blind man was sitting by the road begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening, and they told him, Jesus of Nazareth is passing by. Well, the answer caused the blind man's heart to skip a beat. He had obviously heard of Jesus's reputation as a miracle worker. Jesus, the man who could heal anything, was right there in the crowd. And this was an opportunity not to be missed. So the blind man shamelessly cried out for Jesus's attention. By using the messianic title, son of David, have mercy on me. The blind man was expressing his faith in Jesus as the Messiah who could save him. He was asking Jesus to feel compassion for him. You know, one without sight could see that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, while the sighted religious leaders were blind to his identity and refused to recognize him as the Messiah. Well, in 39, the crowds attempted to hush the man, but that only made the blind man more persistent. He shrieked even louder and made a spectacle of himself. It worked. You know, I was thinking that any normal human being heading towards certain death on a cross would be extremely preoccupied and probably not in the mood to help others. But that's not how Jesus is. He was always merciful and compassionate, and he did not reject the crowd. I mean, the man as the crowd had done. He heard the man's persistent cries and stopped. He has just spotted his father God at work in the crowd. Here was a human soul in need. A blind beggar was shouting at him. So Jesus ordered the man to be brought to him. And in verse 41, the Lord asked, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked him to voice his request, probably to draw out his faith in Jesus. And the man's reply would reveal his heart. Would he merely ask for money or would he ask for a miracle? The blind man called Jesus Lord, believing in his supernatural power to do what only God can do. Without hesitating, the man replied, Lord, I want to see. How many times in his life had he voiced that desire? Probably thousands. And Jesus's question might have seemed a bit odd. It's pretty obvious that the beggar wanted to see. But the beggar's blindness was um, only one of the ways in which he needed God. The man needed forgiveness too. And that's exactly what Jesus sensed in him. Without even laying hands on him, Jesus spoke beautiful words. Receive your sight. Your faith has healed you. Jesus's response was twofold, sight and salvation, both physical and spiritual healing. And the man immediately began following Jesus, praising God, and his joy was so contagious that it started a chain reaction among the crowd, and they also praised God. So in conclusion, Jesus has taught us many things in Luke 18. We learned about the need for persistence in prayer from the widow about God's desire to answer prayer in contrast to the reluctant judge. The attitude of humble prayer as opposed to proud boasting as seen in the Pharisee and the tax collector. The necessity of becoming like a child to enter the kingdom. That Jesus is good and God, just as the young ruler described him. The danger of possessions robbing us of eternal life. The reward for sacrificial discipleship as the 12 gave up everything. The inevitability of Jesus's betrayal and death in Jerusalem and the promise of his resurrection on the third day. The inability of disciples to understand the difficult news and the care of Jesus for one who needed him and believed in him. So Luke 18 invites you and me to also persist in faith and prayer, to maintain a childlike attitude of trust and hope, to give up our reliance in possessions and wealth for trust in Jesus, because Jesus promised that such a life of faith will result in rewards now and in the future.
So let's read the summary for Luke 18 together. In this chapter, Jesus has encouraged his followers to pray with persistence in the parable of the widow and judge, to pray with humility, the parable of the two men who prayed, and pray with assurance because our heavenly father welcomes his children. The first parable illustrates the importance of prayer for Christians. In the same way as the widow, Christians should not give up praying to God, even when facing indifference and powerful opposition. If an unjust judge will eventually give justice to a very persistent widow, then the Lord, who loves his children, will surely answer his people's prayers. This parable concludes the previous chapter, which addressed the future coming of the kingdom of God. Jesus asked in verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? So the appropriate response to the delay of Jesus' coming is to not give up on prayer. Instead, his followers must believe in his imminent return and continue in faithfulness and prayer. Well, after encouraging the disciples to be persistent in prayer, in another parable, Jesus taught them about attitudes in prayer. This parable sharply contrasts the prayer of a Pharisee with that of a tax collector. The first prayer was essentially a personal eulogy, while the other prayer was a heartfelt plea for mercy. Jesus commended the tax collector for his humility before God. Then he ended the parable with his familiar saying that the exalted would be humbled and the humble exalted. The lesson is clear. When you come to God in prayer, humble yourself before him. Then he will not only forgive your sin, but also empower you and lift you up because he who humbles himself will be exalted. So the combination of both parables is that believers are instructed to pray with the determination of the widow and the humility of the tax collector. Jesus used a child's humility as a striking picture of the appropriate attitude with which to approach God. Childlike faith means trusting God no matter what. And Jesus speaks to the rich young ruler. Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? The rich young ruler's question assumed that the hope of eternal life depended on what one did or failed to do. But first, Jesus wanted the man to realize that in recognizing Jesus as good, he was really ascribing deity to Jesus, since only God is truly good. It seemed that the man did not catch the implications of Jesus' reply, because if he had, he would not have dared to disobey a new instruction from God in verse 22. Jesus indicated that he knew the man was sincere in his effort to keep the teaching of the law. You know the commandments. And the young man agreed, all these I have kept since I was a boy. But Jesus perceived an area of weakness, his wealth, and so gently told the young man that it was the money itself that was standing in the way of his reaching eternal life. Ironically, the ruler's attitude made him unable to obey the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. The young ruler did not love God with his whole heart as he presumed. His many possessions were his God and his source of security. Of course, the task of selling every possession would not of itself give the man eternal life, but such radical obedience would be an important first step. Jesus' words were a test of this man's faith and his willingness to obey. Only then could he submit humbly to the lordship of Christ. If he would do that, then Jesus invited him to come and follow him. By placing his faith in Jesus and then placing his treasure in heaven, the man could be assured of his eternal destiny. Well, Jesus prepared his disciples again for his coming death. He had already set his face toward Jerusalem, knowing that he'd have to be there for the Passover, knowing that he had to die. He explained that when they arrived in Jerusalem, all the predictions of the ancient prophets concerning the Son of Man would come true. Nothing would catch Jesus off guard. Events about to occur were part of a divine design that must happen. So sad were these words that it seemed the disciples did not even hear the last sentence. On the third day, he would rise again. They simply could not grasp the scope of God's plan of redemption. This hiddenness was mentioned earlier in chapter 9 and would not be illuminated until later when they had seen the risen Christ face to face.
Jesus asked this blind beggar, what do you want me to do for you? Though Jesus knows our needs, he wants to hear us say them. In the end, the blind beggar followed Jesus, something the rich young ruler was unable to do. But then the blind man had nothing to leave behind. Ironically, while many struggled to see who Jesus was, a blind man had 20-20 vision. The blind man stood in stark contrast to the rich ruler. That man had everything the world offered, but he could not see clearly enough to realize that a trade of earthly things for heavenly treasure was a good deal. The blind man saw in the darkness of his blindness the light of Messiah. And that is what Jesus affirmed in his healing. The switch from begging at the side of the road to journeying along with Jesus pictured the change of direction Jesus brings to life. In giving sight to the blind, Jesus was performing his messianic task that he had proclaimed at Nazareth in Luke 4.18. So next week in Luke 19, we read finally a Palm Sunday, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. It's a wonderful lesson. So thank you so much for joining us. God bless you and see you next week.